Lord Jesus, you fasted 40 days and 40 nights for our justification. Grant that we may have discipline in our sanctification. The second internal criterion, first rules consistency, is coherence. It's not sufficient for symbols in a system merely to be consistent. Absence of contradiction, contradiction may be due to the fact that the statements are unrelated. For example, consider the following three statements. The price of bananas at the supermarket just went up. The wind is blowing from the west this morning. My dog is sleeping in the corner of the room. <clears throat> All three statements may be true. Certainly there's no logical inconsistency among them. But there's also no coherence in them. They're simply three unrelated, isolated statements. Coherence means a genuine unity, an interrelatedness among the components of a system. I'm trained in logic and philosophy. But, yeah, his illustration suffers. There is coherence in those three statements. It's called Divine Providence, Westminster Chapter, Confession Chapter 5. Some have tried to make these internal criteria the sole basis for assessing the theory. This has been especially true of certain idealists and to some extent a contemporary conservative philosopher Gordon Haddon Clark. Yet if Christianity is indeed to be judged as empirically meaningful, it must meet the external criteria as well. Otherwise the system may refer only to what Morris calls designata and not denotata. Such a system would be like a piece of fictional writing which is meaningful only in a limited sense. The first external criteria is applicability. The synthesis must be capable of illuminating some experience naturally and without distortion. It must ring true to life must correspond with and serve to explain some reality. What it describes, it must describe accurately. The synthesis has a direct applicability to a specific question, but beyond that there is the second criteria of adequacy. Since a worldview is intended to be a conceptual synthesis, it must in theory be capable of accounting for all possible experience. A view which can tie together a large sweep of experience with less distortion than an alternate view must be graded higher <clears throat> and hence regarded as preferable to the other. In a psychology class during my undergraduate days, the behaviorist professor was asked for his opinion of the Duke University studies of extraordinary perception. Those data do not fit <clears throat> within our frame of reference was his reply, so we ignore them. His frame of reference was in need of enlargement, for it could not account for all possible experience. A naturalist may have a very consistent theory of what a human being is, but find that the theory is strained by what he feels at the birth of the first child. As Ferrara puts it, an adequate worldview will be able to interpret all experience without oversight, distortion, or explaining away. If these criteria are fulfilled by a particular worldview, then we may then may we not claim truth for the system. If it serves more effectively than our alternative models to cast light upon our experience. Moral, sensory, aesthetic, and religion, may we not conclude that reality itself is best served and interpreted by that particular model? This is not a mere theoretical model we're talking about. The system we have in mind has a practical relationship to its knower and interpreter. The content of the metaphysical synthesis is found in the system. Christian theology possesses great power to affect the person who knows it. It has, as Farrar says, immense responsive significance. 
the model of creative, self-giving, personal love of Jesus Christ. It offers the promise of purpose, forgiveness, guidance, and much else for human life. This is not to advocate prior pragmatism, the philosophy that something is true because it's workable, but it is reasonable to expect that if something is true, it will be practical. We need finally to note that the nature of the description of reality found in the conceptual synthesis is not quite the same as that present with scientific statements or protocol empirical statements such as the book is on the chair. The relationship between language and referent will not always be obvious because the meaning of the fact is related to the system of interpretation within which it is placed always be possible to establish the meaning of each symbol individually. The contention here then has been that the language of Christian theology is cognitively meaningful, for its truth status is a metaphysical system. Its truthfulness can be tested by the application of several types of criteria demonstration that the Christian theological system meets these criteria is the task of apologetics and therefore lies beyond the scope of this book. The point here is that one one makes basic presuppositions described in chapter one, God in his self-revelation, and works out the system that follows from the implications. That system can be regarded as cognitively meaningful. Theological language is a means to discernment and commitment. Ferrar has made a whole class of religious propositions respectable by observing that they are cognitively meaningful as signs of a metaphysical synthesis. But the problem of the meaning of individual religious propositions remains. While well, the meaning of these propositions depends upon their relationship to the system as a whole, there is still the problem of how to respond. Fideism says that we must accept certain tenets of faith, and if we cannot understand those tenets, we cannot know what it is that we are to accept on faith. Ian Ramsey notes that religious language is not a set of labels for a group of hard objective fa facts whose complete meaning can be immediately perceived by the passive observers. There are in fact two levels of meaning. One is empirical, which lies on the surface and is quickly understood. The other is a deeper meaning which is also objectively there but must be drawn out. Ramsey gives numerous examples of what he calls the penny dropping, the light dawning, or the ice breaking. It's, he's referring to situations in which a second level of meaning becomes apparent as one's perspective changes. The tongue-in-cheek illustration is drawn from gestalt psychology. There are some kinds of bread sold in French shops, some are shaped some like, some like, some like, but when we put them all together, we do not have French bread, but a Frenchman. Uh, other examples come to mind. At one time, we seem to be viewing the reversible staircase from above, at another time from below. When we see it one way, the other perspective is not evident, but it is also objectively there. In each case, there is more than one meaning to be found, but discernment must occur for the second meaning to be seen. It is not obvious to everyone, but anyone who has attempted to teach mathematics to elementary school children knows that a process of discernment must take place, although truth is objectively present. Another example is the experience of viewing a mosaic at a very close range and seeing only individual pieces and stepping back and seeing the overall pattern. Religious language is much the same. There are two perspectives, two levels of meaning. 
language which has an obvious empirical reference also signifies an objective situation which is not so apparent. An example is the new birth, or birth, which immediately is understood on a sensory level, sensory level, is qualified or modified in logically odd ways. Thus it is shown to signify something more than a mere literal meaning of the symbol. The language of the author successfully accomplishes his purposes it will evoke a discernment of something more. Yet the something more was always objectively present. The illogical language resembles expressions like the army marches on its stomach. If we take this literally, we may conceive of the army as some sort of odd animal, a crossbreed between a snake and a dachshund. This is, of course, ridiculous, but there is an objective meaning to which the expression refers. The odd qualifiers help to discern the meaning. With all this is what all this suggests is that religious language will be based on empirical reference, but will employ odd methods to bring the readers and hearers to the understanding of the full meaning. It will commit whatever category transgressions are necessary to convey the meaning that can simply not be unpacked by an exegesis of the literal meaning. Thus, in referring to the Trinity, one may find it helpful to use faulty grammar such as he or there, and there it, they is one. Or one may use riddles, puns, analogies, illustrations, all of which nibble at the edges, as it were, of a deeper, fuller meaning, in the hope that discernment will occur. At this point, Ramsey's emphasis that this is not subjectivism needs to be reiterated. The fuller meaning is always present, although not obviously so. One additional element should be added to Ramsey's analysis, the discernment of which speak should be attributed to the illuminating work of the Holy Spirit. Note the goal of religious language is not merely discernment. It is also intended to elicit commitment. Here we find a common element present in the thought of Ferrar and others. Language, at least that of the Christian religion, is not merely informative. True Christianity is present only when commitment is present. He's wrong on this. Had a total commitment at that. True Christianity is there whether the commitment is there or not. That's the process of discernment is a means, <coughs> a necessary means to that end. To summarize, we've rejected the narrow criteria of meaningfulness proposed by logical positivism. We have, however, maintained that although knowledge is not gained exclusively through sense experience, there is such a thing as direct revelation from God to man. Its meaning is grasped on an empirical basis. Meaning is found in symbols which on the surface refer to sense experiences. But the meaning of theological language goes beyond anything literal in those symbols. While the meaning is objectively present in the symbols, it must be discerned. It cannot be extracted by strictly scientific method. We've seen that Horder makes this very point, although from a slightly different angle. He asserts that religious language is basically personal and hence not amenable to scientific analysis. And yet, as Ferrar has shown, the propositions of religious language are cognitively meaningful, not as isolated statements of facts concerning sense experience, but as part of a broad metaphysical synthesis. And here we end that chapter. Let us pray. Glory be to the Father, Son, and Holy Ghost.